This episode is made possible by our generous patrons. Welcome to episode 133 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week we discuss Thomas Harris's 1988 novel, The Silence of the Lambs. All right, here we are, man. One of the one of the big ones we've been we've been looking forward to for a long time. And I had never read this novel before. I don't know about you, but um, it was a really interesting uh, novel to read. I mean, I've really, really enjoyed myself. I and I was expecting it to be different than the film. Yeah. which is something I'm sure we'll talk about, but very much not different, almost in any way. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was I was surprised, so, like a surprising amount of similarities between this and the movie. Um, and I, rem- I, I think I had kind of let this story sleep in my mind, and I didn't remember how much I liked it. If, you, if people are into true crime and stuff, it's like the ultimate version of that. You have like this like super mastermind antagonist who's like cunning, but also like charismatic. And I, I just was really engaged with it. Yeah, and uh, it's a complicated book. You know, I was I, I was kind of struck by how expertly plotted it is, how complex the plot is, and then like you mentioned, the antagonist. I assume you're referring to Hannibal Lecter. Yet Buffalo Bill is also the antagonist, and perhaps the right. primary one. And Hannibal also fills this role of sort of the mentor character that you often see in other books. So there's like a blending of roles here. Um, and you have multiple plot arcs and you have multiple storylines going on at the same time, um, all really expertly done so that nothing really drags, in my opinion. And you have this t- taut thriller, um, which in the thriller genre you want, you don't want tension to to really flag. And, and I didn't feel like it did. It felt like it pulled me along and was engaging um, while being written in a, with a very deft hand and uh you know a critical eye uh through thomas harris so i thought w- made some really great observations and uh had some really beautiful writing yeah and just the research involved like the you know the moth is something interesting um a lot of the stuff that went on with the smithsonian was was clearly well researched and and even sort of the game that hannibal lecter plays with the senator at one point is very clever in just like sort of a wordplay knowledge of chemical compound makeups but i wanted to ask you other than this because this is my only frame of reference this is my my only touchstone for Hannibal Lecter I haven't I saw like one episode of the show um Hannibal and I didn't I've never seen Red Dragon that's something that I've been meaning to watch really um I was gonna ask you like how much how much of this stuff have you seen uh so I've seen uh Hannibal I've seen Red Dragon uh and I've seen this I have not seen the original Mind Hunter adaptation of Red Dragon which I've been recommended several times from people that actually predates this um not as well known um, that's something that we might end up touching on in a future bonus episode or something once we get to Red Dragon. Um, and then I have seen all of the TV series, which I thought was excellent. So I, I, I'm pretty steeped in it. I have not seen Hannibal Rising, which I know is an adaptation of a novel, uh, one of Thomas Harris's novels. So um, that's that's the one that is a blind spot for me. Just out of curiosity, Anthony Hopkins played Hannibal Lecter in the Red Dragon that came out after Silence of the Lambs also, right? Yes. Which was sort of like a prequel that he was doing as well. So, yes. And did he also do another one? Yes, he did. He did the movie Hannibal as well, which came out between those two films. It came, Hannibal came out after, yeah. So the timeline's all over the place. And yeah. you can't really judge it based off of like Han- Anthony Hopkins looking older <laughs> because he looks older with every additional movie regardless of the timeline. So yeah. you just have to kind of, you know, roll with that. How does Mads Mikkelsen's uh, Hannibal match up with with Anthony Hopkins? It's really good. I mean, he ma- he makes a lot of different choices. Um, it's a very different character, and I would say not nearly as faithful as say like this Hannibal is. Um, but it's it's a beautiful, dark, twisted show that I know a lot of horror fans really appreciate, um, and I enjoyed it too. I I don't think it's perfect. It ha- it has flaws. There's reasons it wasn't more popular than it is. Um, there's a reason it's kind of a cult show, it feels like, in some ways. Um, but and especially, I think the first season is a little bit uneven. But it, as it built, it got really, really out there. And 
Um, it's a difficult show for me to recommend unless I know what kind of things people are into, you know, because it is like the stuff they got away with on network television is incredible. The it's it's definitely the most grotesque thing I think has ever been on NBC, bar none. Yeah, I mean, I think I will eventually loop back around to watch that show just because I, I like Mads Mikkelsen enough. Yeah. And, and I, I, you know, I think this this reading kind of reengaged me with this material and Hannibal Lecter. It's it's tough because, like you said, he he plays in this within the story. Hannibal Lecter does play this sort of mentor, and there are moments where you're kind of pulling for him, and you like the relationship that he has with our main character, uh, Clarice Star- Starling, mm-hmm. and and then and then he says something just off the wall, batshit crazy, like <laughs> talking about eating people, and you're like, yeah. oh shit, he's like a piece of human filth, <laughs> and like, oh yeah, is like a murderer and stuff. Uh-huh. So it's he's a very I don't know charismatic character for sure. Yeah. And and we've talked about it already, but this book and the movie are very, very close. We're going to make some comparisons, I think, in this book episode to the film. Um, and then maybe we'll focus more on, like, background, performances, history with the you know film. Because the film's very well known. So uh, we'll have other things to talk about with the film episode, I'm sure. But this may be the most faithful adaptation we've covered. As far as, like, a one-to-one, they took the book... And they put it on screen, and it really shows, in my opinion, it really highlights the differences in medium. So you see, like, okay, this worked in this book for a reason. They wanted to put it exactly on screen, but they can't because of limitations of the medium. So this is how they interpreted it, yet it still feels like the same thing. Um, and right. you see, and you, that, I think, is actually a really interesting thing to look at because a lot of the adaptations we've covered on, the, on this podcast have not been that <laughs> have been very broad or reimaginings or or what have you i don't know what what do you think is off the top of your head what's like one of the more faithful adaptations we've covered I, I agree with you this this is very similar it's been long enough to where i don't remember every specific detail from the film and i'll be excited to see like w- the decisions that were made to change it mm-hmm. but another one that we've covered uh that was super faithful i would say is like some of the early harry potters maybe like sorcerer's mm-hmm. stone chamber of secret stuff is like yep. very very like one-to-one for the most part a couple scenes pulled out here and there um but i think that's to be expected with that that sort of story because it's a continuing saga that they're trying to tell well and like you know some of the lord of the rings films are are very close but like they change a lot too you know like uh, yeah i i I, we don't want to spend too much time talking about that but essentially this is right up there and maybe the most faithful adaptation i think we're going to cover or or have covered so far I would say that it, yeah, I think it probably will be up there when we're, yeah. you know, when we've covered thousands of th- of projects or whatever. It'll probably <laughs> still be up there with yeah. like the the most perfectly like well, like detailed to detail, yeah, uh, sort of adapted well, story. And like I've seen this movie, I've probably seen this movie ten plus times. Um, it's it's a movie I really enjoy, and I've seen a lot over the years, and fairly recently, like within the last few years, I've seen it. So, I was. When I was reading the scenes, I was like, this is word for word. Like so many times it is word for word what Hannibal says, motion for motion. Um, it's just so much is directly like they used this book for the screenplay. And they were like, well, if he says this in the book, we're going to have him say it in the film. We're not going to change it at all for like a lot of it. So it, I don't know. It's just going to be really interesting to sort of dig into the differences in medium. I think that, that this leads to because so little of it has been changed that you can just show like what really works here and what works what works in the film. I think another reason why I think another reason to not change it is because it's such a strong and like you were talking about before such a tight narrative and like every detail is propelling that plot forward and I think to change it I, they do change like a pretty fundamental part of it in order to cut time. Yeah. Um and and you know we'll get to it but I I think they're a, somehow able to sort of what I think what that side story was doing was showing us like the capability of Clarice eventually I think in the movie what the, the reason they decided to cut it was because it took such a long time it was tons of chapters in the book and they realized we can cut all this time as long as we like before this scene and after th- where the scene is supposed to take place we sort of like drive home the points that that side story was supposed to represent does that make sense specifically what scene are you talking about this because I can think of a couple things that might fit the bill for this she sent off to to sort of find eventually what leads to her finding the head Mm-hmm. Like a lot of a lot of like the investigation of that ends up being cut because sure. she's it gets, it gets shortened 
I was going to say one one of the main differences here is just like we get more of a lot. Like there's there's just more to some of these scenes. We get more backstory for sure. I, I felt like there was more of Hannibal like telling her, oh, like this is what happened. And there was less investigating in the movie. I thought that in the movie she was sort of figuring it out from context clues. Whereas like here he's literally saying like he's telling her who this person is and, and how he used to kill people. And that leads her to eventually find the body in the so you're talking about a subtle difference with like Starling, the character in the film, is in that she seems to be figuring out more on her own. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, one of the other, you know, subplots that gets cut is uh, everything with Crawford's wife, Bella. Uh, sort yeah. of, she, he's dealing with her being ill throughout the book, and then she passes away, which affects like the way Crawford's character is, is sort of portrayed in the book versus what we see in the movie later. So uh, that that's definitely something that is that has changed. But like we're hitting some of the only changes right now. You know what I mean? There's not a lot of other ones. <laughs> I think that's basically it. Yeah. And th- <laughs> but I did like the you know, I, and I think that's what's cool about doing this sort of adaptation thing, seeing the, the deeper version of it. We got to see Crawford as a character, whereas I felt yeah. like in the movie, he doesn't necessarily he kind of fulfills a role but isn't like a character unto himself all that much. Like he probably is like, you know, it's been a while since I've seen it, but in the book, I really felt like, oh, this is a character that we care about his hopes, Mm. desires, and like what's going on with him and that kind of thing. I think for me, I suspect that it has something to do with this being the second book in a, in a, what ended up being a four book series um, for a long time was three, uh, where I think he is a recurring character throughout. Okay. So we're, I think we're developing this character um, and we're we're tracking him throughout the sort of trilogy of Hannibal novels that, that Harris originally released. So I think some of that is the reason that we're really delving more into him, whereas Sons of the Lambs uh, that, that was made as this original adaptation was sort of intended to just be its own thing. And I think because of its runaway popularity, it ended up being more than that. But uh, it felt to me like it was intended to just be this standalone film. And because of that, uh, we didn't get nearly into Crawford's backstory. Um, or maybe it was just cut for time, a combination of both, like you said. It, it's one of those things that we can talk about. I think it works better in a book than it would in a movie. Um, in a book, it's nice to actually have a little bit of downtime every now and then to take a breath, shift gears, and do something else. And that's what these scenes tend to do for us. They humanize Crawford in a way Um, which is interesting because we see that the way he behaves around Starling is not the way he is in his own mind. Um, So we see kind of the the dichotomy there. And then I felt like a lot of those scenes added a nice uh, sense of gravity to death in in general. Like it was dealing like death is sort of oppressive in this book. It's everywhere. And in many ways it's dealt with in sort of a cavalier way. Um, you know, that's the way that the FBI and these people have to deal with it. They have to sort of dehumanize and distance themselves. Um, yet this humanizes and brings death front and center and shows the tragedy uh, surrounding it. And I think you can extrapolate out from that and say, like, well, all the other deaths have this sort of same effect. And it's this serious elsewhere, even when it's not being presented that way. So I like the the sort of it, I feel like it spilled over into other scenes in that way. And it made death um, even more tragic than it might have otherwise seemed. The way that the story is plotted, it, it feels like everything everything is is going to mesh together in this sort of spider web in the way that like, you know, we're, we at first we don't really understand why Clary, why um, Han- Hannibal is so interested. And I guess we never really understand it's because he's so bored probably, but he's so interested in, in Clary Starling's like backstory. Mm. Um, but like by the end and, and and just from a story perspective by the end it makes so much sense to the reader because it's like we're seeing the comparison of her motivation like why she is the way she is like why she's like um you know a woman in this in this man's world and like fighting her way through all of this stuff that she has to yeah um and ultimately it comes to be sort of like this this she's like trying to save the innocent because of things that happened to her earlier in life and you know i think hannibal himself draws the parallels from Catherine, I believe, is the mm-hmm. woman who's been abducted. Yeah, Catherine. Uh, like draws the paralyze- parallels between her and like the sort of the lambs that were screaming from her childhood. And sure, um, feel like we're getting into a lot of plot so that's stuff. That's okay. Though. I have a theory yeah. about that. So for uh, and, and it's honestly something that I don't know that I ever really picked up on in the film. Maybe just you know I was being dense about it. But in the book, I it kind of crystallized for me. Uh, Lecter is compared through the narration to the moth that drinks tears for sustenance 
we get this particular detail about these moths who can live on tears. And Starling sort of compares Buffalo Bill to that, but I think uh, there's a scene later when when Lecter is talking to the senator, mm-hmm. and he he savors this moment of pain that he gives her, and he's like, ah, oh, that's because enough of the for knife. Now. It's because she he like told her that like this person had um, whatever bone anthrax or whatever like elephant bone anthrax, and that's like a knife maker's disease or something, mm-hmm. or or so, something that they come up against. And so it made her realize that like oh. You know, her daughter could be flayed or something right now. And, and like he like savored in that moment, like yeah. you're saying. And which made me, immediately made me think of this tear drinking moth. And so that gave me more like I, I understand boredom is a, is a big motivation for Lecter. Um, mystery. I think he is. I think he's intrigued by Starling and trying to figure her out and her motivations and this backstory that like is at the core of who she is. He really likes to understand people. And I think he's sort of intrigued by her and really wants to understand her. And then there's the added element of he wants to dredge up painful memories because he literally feeds off of people's pain. Um, right. And so when he can get her to focus on a painful memory, he gets satisfaction from that. So to me, that's like, I think like between those three things, I think I've got them figured out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the fact that he's a psychiatrist or psychologist that has the background that he does, the way that he's able to just pick people apart and know things about them that just from context clues and things like that. Um, I think this is like, this is like one of the most gleeful antagonist villains that you can, I think he's one of the most terrifying as well, just yeah. because it's like, it seems true to life. Like it seems like someone could be this, this sort of brilliant and, and like this deadly and, and sort of just if they're, you know, their brain's been yeah. tweaked in the wrong way, they could also be a murderer and use all that. Well, to, and he's, he's roughly based off some real people, which we can get into. I was going to get into some of the backstory here so we can talk about that. Yeah, I like to hear about that. Yeah, so first, I mean, let's do it. Let's talk about Thomas Harris first. So William Thomas Harris III, born in 1940, still alive, still writing novels. In fact, he just put out a novel in 2019 um, that is not a Hannibal novel, but it is another thriller. Um, He is best known for his series of suspense suspense novels about Hannibal Lecter. The majority of his works have been adapted into film and television, the most notable being The Silence of the Lambs, which became only the third film in Academy Awards history to sweep the Oscars in major categories. Which, you know, a little taste of what we're going to get into next week, I think, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Um, so Harris was born in Jackson, Tennessee, but moved as a child with his family to Rich, Mississippi. He was introverted and bookish in grade school and then blossomed in high school. He attended Baylor University in Waco, Texas, where he majored in English and graduated in 1964. While in college, he worked as a reporter for the local newspaper, the Waco Tribune Herald, covering the police beat. In 1968, he moved to New York City to work for the Associated Press until 1974, where he began work on Black Sunday, which is a novel. It was his first novel, and it is a thriller about a plot by terrorists to commit mass murder during the Super Bowl, uh, which was eventually adapted into a 1970 film, or 1977, something like that. I I forget the year. But I thought that was pretty cool. So, truly, most of his books have been adapted into films. So, he's got some sort of magic here, (laughs) you know, because that's very rare that you see that. You mean, Stephen King... Even him, like, I don't even know if you could say most of them, a lot of them for sure. Um, but yeah, most of this guy's books uh, have been adapted. And I think there's some there's some interesting tidbits in there. Um, I think working for a local newspaper, covering, covering the police beat, clearly influential, right? Like, he, he understands how the police work. He understands a lot about law enforcement. Um, and then, yeah, working for the Associated Press, uh, you know, I, I feel like as a journalist... It, it seems to lend itself well to being a thriller writer in some ways because there's an emphasis on efficiency in language that I think journalism, you know, requires in many ways and is expected of you when you're writing these uh, stories. And in some ways, other fiction will encourage you to write a little more and to not be so sparse. But thrillers, in particular, often benefit from not over not overstaying your welcome and like getting through things quickly and keeping the pace moving. Um, so I wonder if that helped a little bit. I assume it probably did. Now, little is known about Harris's personal life as he avoids publicity and interviews. No, he, so he did do an interview, I think, fairly recently. Um, so I'm not sure. There is some more information here. I'm not sure if this came out recently when people started to find out more about him or if this was known through other ways. Um, but yeah, it seems like he really didn't like the limelight, didn't do interviews, and, and not a lot was known about him. What is known is that at Baylor University, he met and, he met and married Harriet Ann Haley, a fellow student, 
1961, they had one daughter uh, before they divor- divorced in 1968. Harris remained close to his mother, Polly, throughout his life and reportedly called her every night, no matter where he was. He often discussed particular scenes from his novels with her until she died in 2011. He lives now in South Florida and has a summer home in Sag Harbor, New York. His long-term domestic partner is a woman who, according to USA Today, used to work in publishing and is as outgoing as he is quiet. Harris's friend and literary agent Morton Jenklau said of him, He's one of the good guys. He is big, bearded, and wonderfully jovial. If you met him, you would think he was a choir master. He loves cooking. He's done the Le Cordon Bleu exams, and it's great to f- fun to sit with him in the kitchen while he prepares a meal and see that he's as happy as a clam. He has these old-fashioned manners, a courtliness you associate with the South. So I just think it's kind of fun to imagine this kind of like jovial bearded guy who loves cooking. Um, but I don't know about you, but I'd be a little nervous going over for a meal at Thomas Harris's home. <laughs> you know, right, if he served you some fava beans. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. More like he's he's having some liver and, <laughs> you know, right. some 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 meat, you know, fancifully uh, prepared, which if you watch Hannibal, the series, they really mm-hmm. focus on his love of cooking. Um, he makes some of the craziest, like most delicious looking things, but you know, like the subtext all the time is that he's making them out of humans. So, uh, it's wild. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I could like, it would be hard, (laughs) but, um, it's not fair. I mean, you know, he's just a character and this guy's, uh, this guy, uh, just loves cooking. And I think it shows in his writing. (laughs) Sometimes it's funny how like the unassuming sort of person has like writes stories like this, you know, like Mm. this is, this is what speaks to him. Uh, after, I guess, you know, he worked the police beat and, and worked in journalism, so it makes sense. But at the same time, like, if he's, like, a jovial, bearded guy who's into cooking, it just goes to show that, like, you can't really put anybody in a box in terms yeah. of, like, what they're interested in writing and stuff. Yeah, and we all have many facets to us. So, you know, clearly part of him is interested in this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, I think people, you know, many, many people love true crime. So the fact that he was fascinated by serial killers, clearly, and knows a lot about them and was able to put that into his work, you know, more power to him. So in his first major interview in 43 years with the New York Times in 2019, he revealed himself to be a nature lover and a longtime visitor and volunteer of the Pelican Harbor Seabird Station and Animal Rescue in Miami, Florida for the last 20 years. The staff were not aware who he was until the interview was conducted, (laughs) Um, which I think is pretty funny. He described fame as more of a nuisance than anything else. Some people just want their privacy. You know, I I feel like someone like Stephen King could have an interview every day if he wanted, but I'm sure he doesn't. (laughs) I'm sure he doesn't want that. (laughs) So I know, isn't Neil Gaiman somewhat, somewhat like private as well? I don't know. I, I don't think either of those are good examples because they're both pretty vocal. The main thing with Stephen King is that he just doesn't go, him and Neil Gaiman both just don't go to a lot of conventions and stuff anymore where you'll see other writers. Right. Um, and that's mainly because their level of celebrity has gotten so out of hand that any room they're in at a convention, like everything else is going to stop. Um, you know, it's either not going to be able to walk the halls, that kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. so th- they tend to do like one-off interviews at different universities or different, um, for different, you know, media outlets or what have you. Um, but they are both still fairly active. They, they give interviews. They do a lot of talks. Neil Gaiman, you know, very active on Twitter, you know, all this stuff. Whereas like Thomas Harris, as far as I know, not very active on Twitter. <laughs> right. So, you know, true, truly just sort of a recluse who, um, and it seems like he hasn't written that many novels over the years either. Like he's written a lot of these Hannibal novels, but not a lot of other ones. So, um, also not super prolific, which I'm actually going to get into a quote here by one Stephen King, which I thought was interesting. A favorite of the podcast. <laughs> Wait, I, so, so he hasn't written all that much, but of, of what he has written, a lot of it has been adapted. You're saying? So he has only written six novels. Four of them wow. are about Hannibal Lecter. One was Black Sunday, which we mentioned recently, which was his first novel. And then his most recent is Carrie Mora, which was published in 2019. So literally, I think Carrie Mora is the only one that wasn't adapted into a film and it came out last year. So it will be. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so I have a, so how when was the last Hannibal Lecter novel published? Uh, the last Hannibal Lecter novel was Hannibal Rising, which was in 2006. And that one, I think, is a prequel about his Hannibal as a child. I don't know. I haven't seen that that film and I haven't read the book clearly. Wow. That's that's really interesting to think of someone spending that much time on one character sort of 
in that way and and that's a lot of time dedicated to Hannibal Lecter yeah so here's a here's a quote that I think might shine a little light on that fellow novelist Stephen King remarked that if writing is sometimes tedious for other authors to Harris it is like quote writhing on the floor in agonies of frustration because for Harris the very act of writing is a kind of torment so I thought that was pretty interesting so clearly he's like talked to the guy and knows that he really struggles uh, with with maybe being productive, I don't know. I wonder if it's the actual physical act of typing or writing it out, or if it's just like the the plotting of the story, that kind so, of stuff. So I found another quote from Harris himself talking about this difficulty, which shines further light on it. So let's get into that. So in 2019, in that interview, Thomas Harris elaborated on his elaborated on his process as well as the difficulty, describing it as quote passive. Sometimes you have to shove and grunt and sweat. Some days you go to your office and you're the only one who shows up. None of the characters show up and you sit there by yourself feeling like an idiot. And some days everybody shows up ready to work. You have to show up to your office every day. If an idea comes by, you want to be there to get it in. So it sounds like he just struggles. Like he, he, you know, it just doesn't work for him every day. And like a lot of, a lot of writers deal with this, you know? Um, he's lucky that he hit so well with his books that he's able to have this career without having to be super productive because the industry standard that they tell you is that you should be trying to write a book a year, which is a very difficult pace for many people to keep up with. If you can't do a book a year, book every other year. But even that it tends to be considered kind of slow. Um, many authors who are especially self-published try and write a book every six months or faster. What kind of length are we talking? Just varied, like any length? Depends on your genre. Um, okay. There's genre standards for every for everything, um, which we could get into, but I don't know how interesting that is. For people. <laughs> we can talk about it later. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about it later. Um, and I'm also not like an expert. This is just things I've heard. One of the things that I thought was interesting when we started this book was that my my uh, I listened to the audio book for much of it, and it started off with this intro that was written by Thomas Harris, in which he talked about this doctor. Dr. Salazar, he called him, who was sort of the real world inspiration uh, for Hannibal Lecter. Um, so some more research has been done about this guy. So it was revealed later that this guy's name is actually Alfredo Bali Trevino, who was a physician from an upper class Monterey family who was found guilty of murdering his close friend and lover, Jesus Castillo Rangel, and mutilating his body. He was also suspected of killing and dismembering several hitchhikers, uh, in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Um, this is a real guy he met, apparently, if we take it, take his story at face value. And he was the doctor at this penitentiary and uh, was the inspiration for Hannibal Lecter. It, it, true to what he said, Halle, uh, Bali was initially condemned to death, but his sentence was later commuted to 20 years, and he was released in 1981. After his release, he continued working as a phys physician until his death by natural causes in 2009. He went away for killing people and then became a physician again? Yeah. After he was released, he became a physician wow. and worked for the next 28 years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So this is this guy apparently is a real world uh, inspiration for Hannibal Lecter. Uh, this is someone that Thomas Harris met. So you don't hear about this is like the kind of stuff that is like mythologized a lot. But it's interesting mm -hmm. to think that it really happened. Like, Thomas Harris really met this guy and inspired him to, to create the character of Hannibal Lecter, which is pretty wild. Crazy. That, that's so, so wild to me because you would think that that would be a more high-profile person on true crime episodes and things like that, that people would be like, oh, the person who inspired Hannibal Lecter. And well, I don't think a lot was known about him for a long time. Yeah, must be what it is. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, this was also in Mexico, not in the U.S., uh, so, so maybe that's why he's not as well known here. Um, I've also heard that the serial killer Albert Fish was, is considered a big inspiration. He was a cannibal. Um, so some people say he was an inspiration for Hannibal as well. It seems clear to me that this is, uh, that, that Thomas Harris knows a lot about serial killers. You can see, uh, some real life inspirations for Buffalo Bill as well. If you know a lot about serial killers, you can definitely see a few that it seems that he, um, was inspired from. In particular, I think he used uh, Ted Bundy, uh, especially for like his method of kidnapping. Um, seemed very inspired by how Ted Bundy used to kidnap women. Um, and then Ed Gein uh, was well known for his 
proclivity in like using the bodies of the people he killed. So um, I, I won't get into too many details of it other than to say that I do know a little bit about it because I've listened to some true crime podcasts that talk about it. It is fairly interesting. Um, and if you're someone else who who has who has been following that kind of stuff, then then some of this might seem uh, familiar to you. And I, I'm sure it was to Thomas Harris. So there we have it. I mean, I don't know what else to get into in the background here. This Thomas Harris, that's that's these novels. Um, he did not write the first, this was not the first novel he wrote. Um, yet I think through the film adaptation being so landmark, this is the one that really propelled him into being like really famous. Although it's interesting to note that his other two films had been adapted um, before this. All right, so I'm going to get into the summary so that we can we can get into this thing. Uh, I've divided it into three paragraphs. Silence of the Lambs centers around rookie FBI agent Clarice Starling and her attempts to stop the sadistic serial killer Buffalo Bill, a madman who abducts overweight women and starves them before skinning them with the intent of wearing their skin. Starling is sent to seek assistance from the serial killer Dr. Lecter, who is locked away in a heavily guarded mental, mental institution. For the murders he has committed, Lecter offers to trade his criminal profiling skills in exchange for details about Starling's troubled childhood. In the meantime, information obtained from Buffalo Bill's most recent victim suggests that he is increasing the frequency of his kills. Okay, so a lot to get into here at the start. Um, you know, what what was your sort of impression on Clary Star Starling, the character here? That's our our main protagonist. I know that in the film, Jodie Foster, like her character of Clarice is supposed to be going through this sort of trainee program and everything. But for some reason, the book played younger for me. Mm. Did you feel any of that? I they just really like highlighted a lot of the student life more. I think uh, we, we got more of her sort of interacting with her roommate, who is also a fellow student. Um, and I think we get more scenes in training. Um, I, I think it's present in both, but I think Jodie mm -hmm. Foster in some ways made Clarice into an even stronger character, which I think is just a testament to how, how well it was performed. I mean, I agree the, I think what the, I think what the book did was kind of go back to her as a trainee. And I don't remember too much of like sort of her going back to the school all that much. Maybe there is, there's like some said, of it. I haven't yeah. seen it in a while. Um, but I, I just felt like it, it sort of like, yeah, it felt sort of like she, she was interacting with her friends who were also going through the program and that sort of thing, her fellow roommate or whoever that was. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, she, I, but I did really enjoy her character. I like this idea of, and I think it's a central idea in this story, this idea of this female character going through this like grueling, like judgmental man's world that's sexist and, and all of that while she's clearly proving that she's, she's proficient in all the things that they are and capable mm -hmm. and she she's seemingly smarter because she's, she's able to contend with somebody like Hannibal Lecter for the most part. Um, but I also think it's very interesting to think of the staff above her who are sending this innocent person who's seemingly going through the training program and, you know, doesn't have a ton of life experience in this in this field so far. Like, you know, some, but, uh, you know, being a senior FBI, you know, person and sending this younger person, I know it's explained later that, you know, be, because she's she doesn't have an agenda, um, you know, Hannibal isn't able to like. He, he he is more interested because she doesn't have an agenda. He he feels like he's able to he finds her to be more interesting than somebody who's just there to ask questions and dig into him and get this profile on him. Yeah. Uh, and it plays in their favor because he becomes interested with her as a person and not just like the FBI coming to investigate him. Um, but just the idea of sending somebody like Clarice, like being like, oh, this trainee, the the <laughs> one of the and, and one of the most clever you know, mastermind killers of all time. Let's just throw her out there. But clearly this story is to show that she's capable enough to, to handle it and does. Um, I found myself, and maybe it's something to do with some of what the, the film said in my mind, like this, the way she kept being treated by the, the male staff. And, and it, you know what, it probably was and still is like this. Um, but there were some times that I was like, that I was like, damn, these people are all fucking assholes. Like, there's not a good one in the bunch. Like, yeah. I guess maybe the person above her. Um, but yeah, it, it seemed like everybody around her was sort of, you know, not in her corner. And maybe yeah. that added to the tension. Yeah, if it wasn't for, um, was it Barry? Is, is that the name of the, the guard? Oh, right. Yeah. The, yeah. the well, the, the uh, instructor for the shooting at the ranges too, right? Yeah, he's, he yeah. seems pretty solid. Um, but I, I had the, the, uh, observation that it felt 
very much like she was descending into hell. Like she was going through all these rings, rings of hell and Chilton is sort of overseeing it all. And like, he's just as bad as many of the inmates. Some of the inmates are working as staff in the asylum. Within the story, I prefer Hannibal Lecter to, to him, you know, yeah. like it, it's Chilton like, is uh, like one of the worst freaking people, ever, you know, of any of them. He's awful. Right. He has yeah. no, he has no regard for any of the people who are actually dying. Like you were talking about before, like he doesn't care that people are dying, that people will die or he, or he only cares in them in the fact that like he can, he would look better if they were saved. And, and it was, you know, because of him. And yeah, I definitely had the observation of in the asylum, especially like everyone there is terrible. Um, and then I think there, he's really saying something with the way that some of the staff that she encounters are actually inmates. I think uh, I think that is just trying to say something about how blurred these lines are, right? Um, where, you know, it feels like who is behind bars and who isn't is sort of arbitrary and, and maybe not even fair. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the scene of her going to talk to Hannibal Lecter is every bit as just thrilling and tense as it is in the film this movie is a very sort of talk heavy right like a lot of the major scenes are two characters just talking with each other yet it feels as dramatic and tense as anything i've seen and it feels like it could be a full pitched battle and not be as like pulse pounding as some of these conversations between hannibal and her um it's so well done it's so well crafted and it really shows that just two characters talking to each other, if the stakes are there and uh, they are here, like it can be just as thrilling as anything else. Yeah, and every detail she gives Hannibal, you're like, oh, was that too much? Does he understand mm -hmm. too much about you now to where he can manipulate you yeah. or he can, you know, if he does get escape, like he he knows, you know, you're just, you're, you feel like she's in danger at all times and like every every single sentence that they that either of them utter, like what are the ramifications of those things that they're saying? Well, and the craft is there in the in the writing like the Thomas Harris meticulously sets up Hannibal Lecter to be what he is um, that the whole process of descending through hell before you finally arrive at Hannibal Lecter, the way that every layer of security and every little story we get about oh, the one time, you know, the nurse got her face bit off like for not following precautions and every little thing like that is adding, adding, adding to the tension of this meeting this first time you meet him like right and every time we get more and more stories about what the stuff that Hannibal has done and what he's capable of um, it builds up to this moment to where when he finally arrives you know what I mean? Like if we had just started with that scene just start with her interviewing with Hannibal Lecter you lose all of that that buildup mm -hmm. is so important to getting that character to hit the way that it does. Yeah, and we, you know, sh even that moment where he's like, you know, I need to see, I need to see some ID because you could just be a reporter or something like that. Like he's, he's so clever at getting mm -hmm. exactly what he wants. Like he, he wants to know who she is, and then because of that, finds out that she's a trainee and finds, yeah. you know, I mean, that's the information that he needs to just start screwing those, start screwing into her brain and like start yeah. picking around in there and stuff he's always one step ahead you know and everything he's always figured out what's he's he really is a kind of a this supernatural anti-hero in many ways and that he right he almost has a supernatural ability to always be one step ahead he's he's the inverse of sherlock right like he's sherlock the right. villain exactly um, yeah. yeah yeah it's it's really it's really something else and part of that makes me think about this story veering into horror you know what i mean it is clearly a sure. thriller and it has like the 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 sort of progression of a thriller in the way that, you know, basically nonstop all the way through we are, you know, the, the plot is propelling us along, but this sort of almost like seemingly otherworldly knowledge and sort of like the, I don't know. He just, like you said, he almost feels like a demon. Like he feels like he's got <laughs> yeah. something, he, he knows something that's not possible. He knows things that it shouldn't be possible, but well, and, and his like sense of smell is so like insanely right. attuned, yeah. you know, he can smell like someone's band aid that they're, that has, that they're like has on their ankle underneath their clothes when they walk by right. like that kind of oh, stuff. And the other thing, the other thing is his sense of, even though he has like this, like he's going to kill people. He's going to eat people as a cannibal. He has this sense of like class to him where mm -hmm. like, you know, when she's leaving, he, that she has like semen thrown in her face and he was like pissed off that the other yeah. guy did it. Like he was like, I would not have had that happen. It was not, it was rude. Yeah. He, he hates rudeness. And sort of all of that leads to this really like, I don't know, dark character yeah. that, that has. And then he whispers has, to that guy and convinces him to kill himself. So, you know, his power is like, can't be contained. Um, and it just shows how dangerous he is, uh, to, to speak with, right? If he's capable of that. No. So that, I mean, that's all great. Um, I do want to touch on another thing you were talking about. 
Uh, and that is Clarice Starling in this like patriarchal society and this patriarchal organization of the FBI and her struggling against that and how central that is to this story. And I think one of the reasons why this is the more enduring work out of all of these is because that struggle is so interesting into people and, and identifiable. Um, and you know, I, I give, I give Thomas Harris credit for it. Um, I don't think it, necessarily holds up to some of today's standards for a story like this. I think there are ways in which it maybe doesn't go far enough. Um, and, you know, it's a man interpreting this woman's, you know, reaction to a man's world. So in some ways, like, it's never going to be as close as if if this character was written from a woman's, like, by a woman. I think it would just be a little bit more authentic. Um, right. But for the most part, I think it was really well done. Right. Like I, there's a difference between like seeing it happen, hearing about it happen and having it happen to you, which is like sort of the whole me too thing that that's gone on. Right. Like, w you know, I think a lot of people just didn't realize, you know, what women were going through in workplaces and how how, you know, p people were seeing things as harmless and, and that sort of thing. And like you're saying, I think maybe the, some of the subtlety in, in terms of like things that that men do to women was lost on somebody who ha never had it happen to them. Um, with yeah. Thomas. I mean, he did a pretty good job, though, with that, right? Like, of identifying these behaviors as being bad um, and, and oppressive and, and creating this, like, barrier that Clarice is constantly having to push her way through. Um, one thing that I felt like he fell a little short was there was a lot of sort of internalized misogyny on Clarice's part that I was that I was picking up on later on when she was talking about these victims. And she was incessantly talking about their size and how fat they were and how you know she was like oh good for you you have good skin and like it just really felt like i don't know that a woman would necessarily be doing this um unless they were really had sort of internalized the misogyny I, I, it's like the patriarchy uh, you know people talk about how it affects everyone right and um including women who sometimes internalize it and the only reason to feel that way is if you feel that a woman's worth is tied to how she looks. And yet Clarice never sort of questions her own observations about it, where she's doing exactly that. Um, so I, I just thought it was a subtle thing that, that um, it felt like that was the one time where it felt like, I don't know that a woman would have made these, these actual observations. This feels like a man speaking through a woman to me. Um, but Obviously, you can't speak for everyone. There are plenty of women out there who, who maybe would make this observation. So it's tough to really say. Um, but for the most part, I thought it was solid. One thing that I didn't give him as much of a pass on um, is a lot of the um, transphobia that is in this book. I think he does take some steps to try and distance himself from it. You know, saying that that you know Buffalo Bill is was not a trans person; that he was something else, and like really, he like he tries. So it feels like as much as he could, he tried to, to distance it. But I just don't know that there's many ways you can read this as not being a very transphobic. Uh, I mean, it's uh, tough when you make it's tough when you make a a horrible killer. You know, someone who's seemingly part part of their identity is that they're like you know sort of like covet what a woman has and all this stuff yeah, yeah. It, it was definitely like a sort of uh, yeah i i really didn't know how to feel about it i felt like yeah. it was kind of i you know i feel like i don't know enough really to to know how a trans person would react to this but i'm sure yeah. that it's not perfect obviously I, I like i appreciated that he took took steps to try and distance himself from it and say like that's not what i'm saying that's not what this character is this character is something else and there are trans people who can kill and there are trans people there are some famous um trans serial killers out there um there's at least one or two i can think of um so it's not to say that like people in the trans community can't be villains and they can um i just think that i am not comfortable in saying that someone shouldn't read this and be offended by it or be like triggered by it or, or be upset with the portrayal because i think that's absolutely valid and, um, I, you know, I totally get it. Uh, I, I guess for me, you know, in my privilege and my being cis, I was able to read it and sort of take it for what it was and take sort of, you know, Thomas's uh, Thomas Harris's uh, word for it when he sort of says, like, that's not what I'm trying to say um, and roll with it. Um, but I recognize that that won't be true for everyone. I, it'll be interesting to see how we feel about the the film once we think about the, sort of this this scenario in that light as well. Yeah. 
All right, let's get to the next paragraph here. The daughter of a prominent senator is kidnapped. Under immense pressure from her commanding officer, Starling further delves into her unusual relationship with Lecter and offers him a transfer from his current asylum to an institution with a more relaxed security if he provides her with the true identity of Buffalo Bill. Lecter uses the offer to his advantage and agrees only if he is able to personally represent the information to the senator. Once at their meeting, Lecter toys with the senator before providing her with a false name that leads the FBI nowhere. Convinced that Lecter knows the killer's true identity, Starling is forced to trade her worst lingering childhood memory, the screaming of the lambs before their slaughter, for information that ultimately leads her to Buffalo Bill. Okay, so a lot happens here. This is like kind of the majority of the movie in many ways. Um, what do you want to t- What do you want to touch on? Well, first, I want to talk about how amazing of a title "The Silence of the Lambs" is, and how like <laughs> once you figure out, once that's all been revealed to you, how I don't know. I find that to be one of the coolest parts of this. Just the "The Silence of the Lambs," it, you know, having no context sounds like an amazing title. You know, yeah. you're like, what is that? It draws so many things to mind. Like you just don't really. I don't think you really put the pieces together. Remember the cover for the film too, where it's like the yeah. death head moth on the mouth, the moth on the face, and you're yeah, like, on the mouth. what? Yeah, I totally agree. It's like so confusing, but you're intrigued and scared. It's, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, coming to coming to find out that, like, she's haunted by these screams of these lambs that were being slaughtered. Yeah. Um, and like what that would do to you and like sort of the loss of innocence that she had to deal with there when, you know, she so, you know, she, her her father had been sort of a beat cop or like a security guard or something. Security guard. Yeah. And and was killed in, in the line of duty, I think, mm-hmm. maybe due to like an error on his own part. Yeah. He had trouble like loading his shotgun or something and was shot. So it's not really his fault. Yeah. But he was shot she because of that her mother couldn't support her sent her away to like this farm somebody mm-hmm. for somebody in her family yeah and then the, she found out that the farm was like a slaughter farm and she tried to well she saves this horse this like blind horse right and she right. runs away on it. <laughs> but this is that's that's all happening as the the lambs are being slaughtered right like this they're screaming the lambs are screaming everywhere and she like runs off with the horse to save it or no? i can't remember if the lamb thing happens there or at the other place no you're right i think it is because it's revealed later that that's why she left she took the horse and left, but it was because right. of the lambs. Yeah, and she right. was like able to keep the horse at the orphanage that she ran away to, and and like she, she that's where she lived out her childhood. Um, but yeah, being haunted by the screaming of lambs and like not being able to sleep and and being woken up by that, and then telling Hannibal Lecter that yeah. feels really ill advised because yeah, know, you have to be very vulnerable, and you're being vulnerable with this monster, right. Yeah. And that's what he wants too. And it's like you Absolutely. said before, sort of like just like sucking in all the torment that people have gone through. Um, definitely a monster. Well, speaking of uh, monsters, let's talk a little bit about James Gum, uh, Mr. Yeah. James Bailey on Twitter. <laughs> James, my yeah, I I couldn't help but be like, damn it, that's a fucking unfortunate circumstance. Uh, <laughs> my yeah. my username on Twitter is James underscore B A I L yeah. Bale, so it's like uh-huh. parts of my first and last name. Mm-hmm. And uh, you yeah. get really mad when people mess it up. <laughs> no i don't but yeah. this, this character definitely uh i i couldn't I, I couldn't believe it i was like damn it that's that's really unfortunate i wish i had realized that before making my name yeah you know and uh interesting character you know that this is, he's very distant from clarice throughout while clarice is very close to hannibal um so hannibal also adds a lot of danger to the present um even when when she's sort of pursuing this otherwise fairly distant buffalo bill um, one thing I really liked, I wanted to touch on, was the moment where Catherine is abducted. Um, I thought that scene was written particularly well, and and one of the things I liked was um, there's something you can do in writing that you can't really do in film, or you have to do it in a different way, and it's where you can like use the language you're choosing to evoke certain feelings and moods, and mm-hmm. um, he he describes the moon as being a hook um when she's out at night and like he does like certain little things here or there to like imply danger and to imply um like this looming threat without mm-hmm. being like he doesn't do it. it's not too on the nose in my opinion and um i don't know i just thought it was cool it's one of those situations like i said where it, the differences in form highlight what you can do well in each form and what you can do to to um make each scene work in a different way and i thought that that was effectively done there 
Yeah, it's almost like subliminally like setting in sort of like the the what what the audience the reader should be feeling. Yeah. Um, just to come to, especially if you don't know how the scene plays out, like obviously we did going into this book, but if it had been the first time, yeah, reading those things and getting that subliminal. Yeah, sort you're of like, like, why am I why am I worried right now? What's dangerous? Oh, there is something dangerous. Yeah. Right. It's really cool. Yeah, I agree. Something that I did want to ask you about was this. So you talked before about like Buffalo Bill versus Hannibal Lecter as like the two antagonists in this story. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, but also mention uh, Hannibal to me feels like he's this removed mentor, like you mentioned, uh, almost like a force of nature. Whereas like and, and like as long as he's locked away, it's everything's going to be OK. Um, whereas like Buffalo Bill is like out on the open out in the open killing people they're trying to actively um track him down so he seems more like a he seems more like an attainable threat to deal with sort of in a Mm -hmm. way whereas like hannibal lecter like seems like he's been dealt with dealt seems like he's been dealt with but then once the flip happens in a little bit um hannibal lecter is immediately where sort of the danger to me is drawn like i'm like buffalo bill has someone and like it's horrifying what he's doing to her um, but Hannibal Lecter getting out seems like he could, you know, seem seemingly kill people forever without ever being caught. Cause he just yeah. like, is that smart? Um, right. and so, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I want to ask like, what, was there a point in time where like you felt like because Hannibal Lecter got out, um, did you feel like sort of Buffalo Bill was less dangerous or, or, and like, I guess the case had gotten to the point where we mm-hmm. were sort of, sort of far along enough to where we felt like he could be captured buffalo bill could be captured i think uh i think it depends on how close you you um have like identified with Catherine and her plight because before it all happens Catherine has already been abducted and i think that's the way that he carries that along like you you feel the danger for her um so even though lector is out now i think we're we're still in the clear and present danger that that you know Catherine is in is what was what keeps us tied to that yeah, and I guess those scenes those scenes are definitely horrifying too. We get yeah. you know moments of of Buffalo Bill watching her through with night night vision goggles and the moths, yeah. all the moth stuff going on. Yeah, and when she sees like, the fingernail and like flips out, right. which in the is both in the movie and in the book, and I think really effective when she like realizes what that means. I did want to mention since we haven't touched on it here, one of the other differences is that uh, the book references Red Dragon some references uh, Will Graham being sort of disfigured by Hannibal at the end of the book, uh, which is going to be a bit of a spoiler, I guess, for when we do cover that book. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I apologize for that. I didn't realize you hadn't seen the movie. Now I feel actually a little bit worse about it, but um, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> um, anyway, th- so th- that's another difference is we get a few references here or there to Will Graham and, and some what has been going on before that. Oh, and one more thing I wanted to mention with, with the two killers in the story is something that I found that the author did that, sort of terrified me even more was how close of a perspective we were able to get into the minds of Buffalo Bill and Hannibal Lecter yeah. getting into like that close third person perspective that we get. Yeah. And, and, you know, getting sort of the inner workings of their mind and what, what they were thinking about and like getting into the mind of a killer like that is, you know, I'm sure super difficult to do it just in terms of writing, but mm-hmm. it's also very effective when done well. And like, it made me realize that, it makes you realize like as much as you might like Hannibal Lecter like he's clinically insane and like you you don't want to like this character because he's gonna kill people and absolutely I mean and that's sort of the the eternal thing that's fascinating about Hannibal and the the tv series absolutely plays with that so much because he's like the main character yet also the main villain of the of the show um so it's, it's a really weird show for that reason like that's one of the way like the main descriptors I would have for that show is just how bizarre it is um i I definitely recommend checking it out just because of how how odd it is um it 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 really kind of does not follow a lot of storytelling conventions in a lot of ways but back to back focusing on this um i found myself having because i had never read this book before my respect for this story and for the and for hannibal lecter as a character um shifted somewhat um, it's not that I don't respect Anthony Hopkins portrayal and I don't respect the film for what it did. Um, but I just have a, a lot more respect, I think for the author, you know what I mean? Like I assumed that he was behind it, but man, like so much of the character is on display. So much of what is great in the film comes directly from the pages of this book. Um, right. so I just like have a huge amount of respect now for Thomas Harris for, for, for creating Hannibal Lecter. 
I mean, definitely this, you know, like you said, they use it basically as a screenplay yeah. and, you know, like, and it's not to take away from the performances and the direction's great as well. And we'll get to talk about that next week, but yeah. this, he, he is to, you know, to his credit, credit, this, this story is as, as tightly wound and sort of as tense as it is. And just some of the, some of the most amazing elements that you would think would have just been adapted are mm-hmm. like literally on the page and like the moments that are most shocking or frightening. Yeah. Uh, one other difference we should point out, six fingers. Hannibal. Oh, yeah, I forgot book. about that. He's got six yeah. fingers on one of his hands. So uh, there you have it. I don't think it ever comes up again, but uh, it's said at the start. <laughs> he, has this, he has a second middle finger, which is apparently the rarest form of, of polydactylism. Um, hmm. Anyway, uh, let's read the final final paragraph I have here. So shortly after, Lecter murders his guards and escapes the asylum, leaving Starling to continue her investigation on her own. In a final confrontation, Starling is forced to kill Buffalo Bill, but he saves the senator's daughter and earns a promotion with the FBI. Lecter writes to congratulate Starling and assures her that while he will kill again, he will not pursue pursue her. All right, so we cover a lot there. The the escape of Hannibal Lecter is just like one of my favorite moments in this book and in the film and just everything. Like it's so well crafted. Um, He's so smart in the way that he goes about it. I actually like this version even a little more. It feels like it's a little bit more elaborate. He's been planning it for even longer um, and, or just waiting for this moment. And then, yeah, you know, the the details about the how his pulse like barely elevates and like all this stuff is like such a just perfect details. Like, I don't know. There's just so much about it. And the plan of getting the SWAT team to sort of come up and uh, him sending the body down on top of the elevator. It's just so elaborate and so well crafted. And uh, also Thomas Harris's writing, he is able to give the misdirect and he's talking from the point of view of the SWAT team and making us think that they're actually closing in. But then it's revealed that, you know, Hannibal is in the the uh, ambulance, pulls the face off. And it's just one of the craziest moments in the film and in the book. Um, iconic. And uh, yeah, just your thoughts on that scene. Like you said, iconic. I mean, it's it's got to be one of the most gruesome and and elaborate amazing scenes ever it's it's incredible and and you know knowing that this was an adaptation i assumed that there were some things that were like sort of added for the film and because the film is more renowned i would say than the book and as far as i've you know experienced Hmm. um i thought maybe you know like it was embellished and made better but all the stuff is on the page and it's it's incredible yeah there i do think there's one small change i don't remember the guard being sort of like elevated and made to look like an angel which i think happens in the film um oh right yeah it was, yeah so yeah, i don't I think that happens in the book but otherwise it's it's very very close right and the this just getting the scene in the book is it's just so interesting always to see something this adapted this closely and to know the film first and sort of to go back and read this mm-hmm. uh I, it's fascinating like the 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 way that i mean it's so gruesome the way that like the face is like spurting blood still mm-hmm. after he's like cut it off and and that's like what the people come in to find and the way that one of the i think one of the swat or guards were like and they've seen so much they've seen car accidents they've seen this they've seen that but this is like the worst thing they've ever seen yeah um it just it's really it's really fun to see that sort yeah. of context and that's one of the things that comes across well in a book right because you can get that internal thought um, I was just thinking about how that scene in the movie, uh, that that change has actually led to so much because I swear that like that you take that scene and that's what Hannibal the show is <laughs> like it's taking it's like making death beautiful and like creating these crazy tableaus and like not only does Hannibal do it, but like all the killers, they they're sort of like chasing because there's other killers in the show like they all do mm-hmm. it in a way. Um, everything is very sort of operatic and over the top. And I think a lot of it comes from that scene. Yeah. Hannibal, like I said before, there's like this class to him. And like, I think it's interesting that there are other killers, but you know, like if he wasn't a killer, you could see him, you know, on a Saturday going to an art museum and just drinking wine and, and like, you know, having great conversation with people and all this stuff. And like, so that's the sort of person he is. So like in his crimes and these deaths and things, it makes sense for them to be theatrical and sort of beautiful in a way and but it's really terrifying stuff yeah yeah absolutely all right we got to move on though so let's talk about the final confrontation uh buffalo bill clarice once again i got to give thomas harris so much credit in in the misdirect um to make you think that she's not at the house and and you know what i mean or or that she's not 
the one knocking at the door. Like there's this really nice swap, you know, bait and switch. And the movie does it really well too. And uh, it, it, as a writer who th- has thinks about plotting a lot, man, that's tough to get your character where they need to be without backup and have it be believable and have every moment have led to this moment to where it doesn't feel like you cheated anything. Uh, right. It's just really well done. Yeah, the the moment where she realizes like if she calls for backup, he's killing her. If she if she doesn't chase him into the house where he wants her, you know, the he did the trap that he can spring on her, or at least she assumes. Yeah. Um, you know, if he if she doesn't go in, he kills her. So the the way that it's sort of it's so it's so vital, like it's so in that moment that you can't there's no escaping it. Like the the main character has to do the thing that you as the reader are like, Don't go in there, but the main character has to. Yeah. Uh, another shout out to the writing. Um, I don't know if you noticed this, but I definitely picked up on it. Um, in these scenes, Clarice's thoughts and her narration gets very short and choppy. And it really adds a sense to the like, urgency of the moment. Like these very short, direct, like, I got to go here. This is going to happen. Then this, this, this is very like clipped. And people talk a lot about how your pro style should match the moment. And this that was on display, display here because it felt frantic. It felt uh, tense. And it really just added to everything else that was going on. And that's just like the formation of sentences, the length of the sentences. So um, that's another thing that I think displays the the strengths of different mediums and the things you can do. Right. You get music, mm-hmm. you get a score in a film. But in a book, this is what you got to do. Well, it, or in choppy editing, sort of faster editing and, yep. and, and you know, cuts. Um, I, I really thought that having Catherine like screaming in the hole added to the chaos of the whole situation as well. Yeah. The dogs barking. Um, like she's trying to come down a staircase, trying to see in the dark somewhat. Right. And like, doesn't she notice the, Oh, and the other thing, another amazing moment. And we haven't really talked all that much about this moth, but the fact that this moth exists yeah, for the, in, in the first place is, is insane and it's super creepy. Um, and then the pupa in the throat and then the moment where she realizes she's in the right place is the, the moth on his back or somewhere she sees the moth. Yeah. It comes out of his robe or something. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of great details about the moths uh, that we haven't got into, like you said, but, you know, that they definitely are like this metaphor for, for everything that's going on. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. it, it plays really well. And it's beyond just the transformation. It's also, like we said, the, the drinking of the tears and stuff. There's just a lot more to these metaphors. It's like a multi-layered thing. And the fla- oh, another thing, just the flapping, like the, the, the way that the wind that they create is described and they sort of squeal and screech and scream yeah. as a moth. And I found that to be unsettling. So <laughs> just lots of cool stuff with that. Yeah. I was happy to see that the dog uh, was ultimately unharmed and got to uh, yeah. got to go home with a uh, what, like somebody. No, they were going to take it to the shelter, but then the person who was going to take it to the shelter ends up keeping him instead. You know, right. not the That's dog's fault was, yeah. that, that its owner's an asshole. You know, don't take it out on the dog. Also, we we, uh, we we hear that the dog wasn't didn't actually break its leg, which I think in the movie we don't get that assurance. Um, when she says, that I think it broke its leg, I, I think it, maybe it's implied that it didn't, but we don't see it. So um, and in, in many ways, it was actually better. I was worried. That was one thing I was like, what if, what if she kills this dog or something? Like, what if something really bad happens to this dog? Uh, you know, as a dog lover, I was I was uh, quite worried. <laughs> right. I think it's it's also in order to like humanize a killer to have him care so much about a dog. Yeah. Um, it's something that people can identify with. Yeah. And like you were just talking about with Hannibal, like, you know, he humanizes these killers in the way that they are multifaceted and they have, you know, the the the, the capability of kindness in some ways. And they're not idiots. And, and um, I think especially for the 80s, like um, this wasn't very well trod ground. Right. Like This is kind of new to be talking about it in this way because even the just the our understanding of serial killers was still fairly fairly nascent, nascent at that point um so i guess wrapping up here wrapping up this novel um one of the big differences i noticed was that uh starling gets involved in a romantic relationship with one of the bug guys um and mm-hmm. then at the end she gets sent a letter from hannibal rather than a call um, but that, that, that's fine to me. He also doesn't get Chilton in the same way. Chilton's in protective custody. Whereas in, I think in the movie, he like is pursuing Chilton at the end of the film. Um, so mm-hmm. that's a little different, but he does threaten Chilton. He sends him some threatening letters or something, but, um, I, I, I don't know how I felt about this romantic relationship because again, it felt like it felt like it undercut some of the messaging of the book to have her pair off 
and feel like she needs to have a man in her life to be fulfilled. Um, in a way, it felt like that that seemed like the wrong path for her. I, you know, we get some of her like um, academic progress and possibly advancement, um, yet that doesn't seem like the main note that we're ending on. And instead we're ending on with this. And then also there's the silence of the lambs moment. The final line of the book is that the, the you know, the lambs are uh, you know, the silence, uh, the silence of the lambs is the kind of the end of the book. Like she no longer hears the lambs screaming in her dreams, um, mm-hmm. which, okay, that's cool. But like, does that mean she's done being a FBI officer now? Like, does she, is she no longer driven to save people and to, you know what I mean? Like, What's that trying to say, I guess? I think you have to bring into context, like, you know, Hannibal has been right about so many things throughout the story. And in his letter, I believe he asks like, oh, have the have the lamb stop screaming? And even if they have, will they continue to yeah. basically? I think that's what he says in his letter. Like, yeah, you're like right. will that be an ongoing thing? Like, or will it just be for this momentary sort of lapse where you get some relief from that? And I would think that because Hannibal has been right about all this stuff so far that it'll it'll come back. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but I just, I don't know. I think that's, that's one way where maybe the film kind of improves it um, because I, I don't think it ends on that same note of her sort of pairing up. And um, I, I think it was smart to resist the urge to have her uh, seek a romantic relationship to make us feel better about her situation. And in the in the movies, aren't the bug guys meant to be really weird and like off putting almost? Well, and they of? and like, they are, I think, for the most part in the book as well. But then there's like the one guy who has been like staying up late doing it, and I'm not sure if he's the same guy or not. I, I lost track <laughs> as like one of the earlier guys. Um, but there's one in particular that she seems to be somewhat uh, open to, and then at the end, she's like going to stay at their house and sleep with a bunch of dogs or something i don't know it, was, it, yeah. was, it sounded like fun but <laughs> a bunch of big dogs on the bed keeping you warm <laughs> but um anyway that's where the that's where the book ends uh like i said um extremely close to the film so um i think it, just touching on some of the, the the differences the different strengths i think is interesting um but beyond that i i think uh, i'm ready to go watch this movie now oh i cannot wait landmark performance from anthony hopkins sort of like one of the greatest antagonist villain you know portrayals of all time so yeah i cannot wait and and jonathan demi like i i'm excited just to see sort of the direction and the things that he did decide to change and like you're saying how he adapts to the, the unadaptable moments these like inner monologue things and like mm-hmm. portrays some of the some of the stuff that's sort of subtext um and like maybe with technique yeah uh, is able to achieve those things yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into that. Um, should be an exciting watch. Uh, we hope you join us next week for that. Uh, we want to thank our patrons for supporting this podcast. Uh, we recently put out a bonus episode on the Tolkien biopic, um, and we'll be releasing another one here soon. We do them monthly. If you wanted to find out what uh, all we have to offer on our Patreon, go to patreon.com slash inktofilm. Follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all of those at Ink to Film. And be sure to join the Council of Inklings. We post polls. We post any sort of adaptation news that we see is relevant to sort of what we're doing here, as well as, you know, let you know about upcoming projects, what we're, what we're going to be up to next. And it's a cool way to stay connected. And if you liked this episode, please let us know in the form of a rating and review on whatever podcast app you use, or if they, you don't have the ability to leave a rating and review on the app, you know, tell a person you know in real life who you think might be interested in the podcast uh you know the old word of mouth reading and review also very helpful um and that would help us to continue to grow and thank you to ross bugden for the use of our intro and outro music all right and just as one little last tidbit i want to know are you going to be drinking chianti or amarone with with your viewing of (laughs) silence of the lambs uh i think i might have a chianti in my uh wine rack but i do not have an amarone so there's your answer (laughs) right I don't think I have either, and we're in quarantine, so I'll, <laughs> so I'll see what I can find. You're not going to get it. Um, you know, I have a couple blends, so maybe I'll just have to research what, what's in there. But uh, yeah, another small difference. Really, there's not very many, so we got to touch on the, what we can find. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Until next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.